Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to now uh, introduce uh, Glenn Nielsen. Um, Glenn Nielsen is a, a senior lecturer in neurological physiotherapy uh, at St George's um, University of London and uh, Glenn has uh, been over in Belfast with us before um, for some training at one of our British Psychological Society uh, events and uh, I've been over to Glen in St George's and visited their service over there and seen the great work that they, they do. Glen has been involved in uh, a number of multi-site uh, randomised control trials, physiotherapy in FND and he's going to talk to us uh, this morning about physiotherapy approaches uh, in FND. We have a similar format um, in terms of, of a talk and then hopefully some time for questions. Um, so it's my pleasure to hand over uh, now to Glenn. Glenn, you're very well. Uh, thanks very much, Nigel. I'm just going to share my screen to uh, put my slides up. Okay, uh, Nigel, can you just let me know if uh, you can see my slides in presentation mode? Yep, <clears throat> yeah, we can see it. Fantastic. Okay, so thanks very much for asking me uh, to speak today. This is a really fantastic topic. Um, I'm stepping in for Paula Gardner, who's a physiotherapist who I work with on some research, and we've worked together on a few different things. So hopefully I'll be able to cover what she's going to cover. Paula's also CBT trained, so she's in a really unique position. Um, I'm going to try and talk about in some sections how physiotherapy can be CBT informed um, and some of those things that I've learned from Paula. So I'll just start on from presentation. Uh, great. So the first thing to say is that physiotherapy, it's usually suggested it's best within uh, multidisciplinary treatment. Um, and it's just one type of therapy that you can have. Uh, and within a multidisciplinary team that would include neurology and neuropsychiatry, psychology, occupational therapy, it might include speech and language therapy, specialist nurses. Uh, there might be value from seeing specialist exercise instructors and social workers. Um, and sometimes this treatment it's written about can be occur sort of in interdisciplinary care, uh, seeing a number of professionals at once. But as probably most people realize is that this is not a really, uh, this is it's quite a rare experience to have multidisciplinary rehab. Most people don't have access to it because of limitations in the NHS. And most people with FND might be lucky to see one of these professions on their own. And I think that's okay because there's still a lot of benefit from seeing uh, a physiotherapist or a psychologist. Um, and and it's, it's great if they can work together. So I'm going to talk about physical rehabilitation and mostly physiotherapy, but I'm going to also acknowledge where I can occupational therapy, and there's a lot of crossover perhaps between physiotherapy and occupational therapy, and there's an important role for both. Um, and so we've written now uh, consensus recommendations, what we think physiotherapy can and should look like, and I was involved in a similar document for occupational therapy. So both of these papers can be accessed just by Google, if you search consensus recommendations for physiotherapy or occupational therapy, they're free to download. And our main recommendations about physiotherapy and occupational therapy is that treatment should involve education, movement retraining, addressing secondary problems that occur along the way, such as pain and fatigue, uh, helping the patient to self-manage, so managing their own symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis. Treatment can include vocational rehabilitation, helping you be okay at work, and then follow up. So a little bit more about physiotherapy. We wrote this document about physiotherapy quite a few years ago now. Um, and this, these are the people that were involved. They were neurologists, neuropsychiatrists, physiotherapists, an occupational therapist and psychology. And our main suggestion was that the, the treatment of the motor symptoms of FND can be based on a real mechanical conceptualization. So really what that means is we think of the movement problems as abnormally learned patterns of movement that can be retrained. We also suggest that symptoms are driven by an abnormal amount of attention directed towards the body and expectations. I'm gonna try and explain what those things mean and how physiotherapy can address those drivers of abnormal movement. Firstly, with attention, functional symptoms require attention to manifest. So when the person's attention is 
on their body, where their awareness is on their body, the symptoms are exacerbated. And if their attention can be shifted away from their body, often their functional motor symptoms reduce. So I'm gonna try and show that in this video here. This is a person with a tremor in her right arm. And when I get her to really focus and concentrate on following me with her left arm, you might see that the tremor stops a bit if the video works. Often it doesn't work so well online. As I stop distracting her, you might see that the tremor returns to the hand. So what this is showing is that attention makes the tremor worse. Distracting the attention can make the tremor a little bit better. And so we think physiotherapy can help by trying to retrain movement by redirecting that focus of attention. And that works for motor symptoms and it might work for other symptoms a little bit as well, perhaps maybe sensory problems that redirecting attention away from the body might be helpful. The other thing I mentioned were expectations, and this is a, a more complex neuroscience thing that I'm not very good at explaining. When we talk about expectations, we don't necessarily mean what the patient is expecting or thinking about. It's just how the motor output works and that uh, expectations, our previous experience of movement influences motor output or symptoms at a, at a pre-conscious level. And it's explained through neuroscientific predictive models of brain function. And physiotherapy may help uh, address this issue by giving people experiences of normal movement. So their brain, if you like, starts to expect it. And these movement, normal movement patterns become more habitual. So it's all a bit complex, but I'm gonna give you an example of how the brain works in this predictive fashion. So this is a hollow mask. As the mask turns around, we should see the inside hollow part of the mask. And for many people, we get an illusion here that it looks convex, it's sticking out. But as the mask turns around again, we can see that it was hollow. So this is an optical illusion, but it's a similar thing to what I was talking about with expectations. So our brain has this expectation that when we see a face, it should point out. What our eyes are seeing is a hollow mask, but the expectation that the face points out overrides, if you like, what we're seeing. And so uh, we're, we, we're given a, a, this is an example of where expectations influence how we perceive the world and it, it also relates to how we move through the world. So I think this is, you don't need to necessarily understand this, but I think it's just a useful thing to be aware of because it helps us understand that movement and sensation can go wrong in the brain without there necessarily being a lesion or a bleed or, or brain damage. Sometimes the motor, the motor uh, system and the, neuro, the neurological circuits become corrupted through mechanisms like this. So, Attention and expectation can be targets for physical therapy, physiotherapy and occupational therapy, and also speech therapy. There might also be other targets that we address during treatment, and this can include a fear of falling. So people who are unsteady on their feet and may have had the experience of falling will often become even more unsteady, and they might start to avoid going outdoors. They might start to avoid walking without holding on to walking aids or the walls. And this leads to sort of what we might call avoidance and safety behaviors and so because they're never actually challenging their balance by walking the balance can get worse over time so this fear of falling is something that needs to be addressed and cbt principles can be really helpful to help people recognize that they are making decisions of avoiding situations where they might fall and in the long run this is unhelpful and rehabilitation should help people take sort of uh perceived sort of risks in their rehabilitation to get better or, or making decisions about those risks. Uh, physical therapy is also important for addressing pain. It seems to be about 70% of the people I see with a functional movement disorder also have a lot of pain or persistent pain associated with their, with their problem. And this can lead to adaptive ways of moving. Uh, sometimes it, it's related with fear of movement, which is called kinesiophobia. So people might stop moving in particular ways. They might stop bending their back or holding themselves very stiff. And they might walk in what's called an antalgic movement pattern, which really just means they walk in a way that it, you can tell that they're walking because, in a way because they're very painful. And these painful movement patterns become very habitual and ingrained and become part of the abnormal movement. So helping people to recognize these painful movement patterns. And often they're a false economy. We sort of change the way we move because of pain, but it doesn't necessarily take the pain away and it can cause secondary problems. So helping people sort of trying to 
to sort of sort that out and try and find more normal movement patterns despite the pain. And often going back to more movement patterns helps reduce pain. And then physical therapy might look for secondary problems such as muscles can become very tight. Uh, people can develop hypersensitivity of their skin and something called allodynia, which is very, very uh, extreme pain people might experience when they have touch. And Professor Stone was talking about desensitization of that. And also physical deconditioning. So because people have motor symptoms, they move less, they become less fit, and they just generally become deconditioned. And this might lead to things like weight gain. So these are things that sometimes physical therapy can help with. In our recommendations, we describe five components of treatment, how to address these issues. So the initial assessment, education, movement and posture retraining, how to support people to self-manage and follow up. I'm going to go through each of these as part of my talk. So firstly, the initial assessment. Maybe Professor Stone talked a little bit about this at the beginning of his talk, but I think a physiotherapy should, a physiotherapist or occupational therapist should really spend a lot of time talking to somebody about their symptoms at the beginning. So the papers that uh, Professor Stone and his colleagues have written about the initial assessment are really, really helpful to read and uh, physiotherapists use that as inspiration for their physiotherapy assessments. So it's useful to talk to the person and find out what happens. We'll create a list of symptoms that they experience and sort of really get to know each one. And often they're quite interrelated, but just this process is really helpful for the patient because often their experiences things just a lot of things happening to them and it's hard for them to make sense of so going through and charting it out often makes it a bit simpler once it's on paper sometimes i can see relationships between different symptoms we talk through a 24 hour uh, period in their life a typical day what they're doing from the moment they wake up to the time they go to bed and often in here we start to see how their symptoms are affecting them but also we see things that they're doing which may be helpful that we can encourage but things that habits they might have got into that might be unhelpful, that might be limiting progress and, and exploring those together and thinking about things that we can change. Talk about pain and fatigue and get a bit of a sense for how that's affecting the person and just find out other important things that we ask about, such as how they're managing with stairs, how they're walking indoors and outdoors. Are they experiencing falls? Do they fall on the ground? Are they injuring themselves from falls? These sorts of things are really important. And then we do a physical exam, so we have a look at the person's movement. My aim for that really is to make sure the patient's been seen. So I want to allow the person to show me what's going wrong. And then I want, so I, we need to give them a little bit of time and look at them, because sometimes there's variability in symptoms, and I want to know if I'm seeing them on a good day or a bad day or a normal day. Um, and I'm more interested in watching them do tasks. So what I mean by that are things like standing up from a chair, sitting down, transferring to a bed, moving and rolling in bed and walking, getting on and off the floors, going up and down stairs. And that's a little bit more interesting to me than uh, testing someone's strength, uh, charting their sensory loss, uh, because I think it's these tasks problems that can really form the basis of my physical treatment. So once we've sort of done the uh, an assessment, we move on to education in our treatment. And this is for me the uh, first real part of treatment proper. And I, I spend a lot of time doing it, usually one whole session. And most patients that we see say that this is often one of the most useful parts of treatment. And my goal is just to help the patient make sense of their illness experience. So what I mean by that is just not their symptoms. I want to go through from the moment they first started to the movement went wrong, things went wrong, and their journey along the way, just to talk them through it to find out what happened to them. As part of ed education, there's lots of important things that we acknowledge. So we, we really need to make a point that these symptoms are real because a lot of the people I see have, have seen other people in the past that may be implied that they just they're not, they don't have real symptoms or there's nothing on the scan, so there's nothing wrong. So it's, that's just not true. And sometimes it's important to say that, to say that these symptoms are common because most people, when they first get this diagnosis, they've never heard about it. And sometimes they feel like it, they're the only person in the world with it. Um, and so just sort of highlighting patient resources and charities is a useful way to make that point. And then we acknowledge that the symptoms aren't under the person's control, but our goal in therapy is to try and 
claw back some control over movement. We describe the symptoms as a problem with function and not structure. So we do that by talking about how it's the motor programs have become, if you like, corrupted because of this attention on the body and normal automatic movement is lost. And it's not due to some irreversible structure. But that's very different to say that it can be completely reversible, as Professor Edwards ended his talk with. Sometimes for some people, symptoms are ongoing and that's not their fault. And in those sorts of situations, physical therapies can still be helpful to help people manage their symptoms. In our education, we acknowledge and discuss the role of triggering factors. I think this is often important uh, to talk about. For example, a lot of people might have a, a, a triggering event that happened. Like for example, they might've been involved in a car accident and had some neck pain, which might've been called a whiplash. And then following that event, maybe they lost control of your legs and they became maybe weak in their legs and developed some paralysis. And in that situation, the, the logical thing to assume was that the, the car accident may have caused some damage to the spinal cord or the brain, which is causing the problem. But in functional disorder, that's not the case. The car accident triggered some situations where the motor programs, if you like, became corrupted. And that's an important thing to talk about, and often it's not discussed with people. We discuss and demonstrate how attention drives symptoms. So the video I showed of somebody's tremor, how it, it reduced or went away when their attention was distracted is, is a useful thing to show somebody once we've talked about the symptoms. It helps people to understand maybe that their role of attention and how they, how they might be able to learn how to control their symptoms or just to help them understand that maybe their awareness on their body is too much. And usually people don't recognize that at the beginning. And of course, everyone's different doesn't necessarily relate to everybody. Um, and then explaining how physical therapy and physiotherapy can help. So what I, how I think it helps is physiotherapy can help retrain movement in a way that redirects, we try to redirect the attention away from the movement and give people experiences of normal movement, which helps sort of adjust that expectation of movement. And of course, that's much easier said than done, but it's quite possible. So this is how we do it. The first, when we do our movement retraining, we start by sort of exploring how the persons move. And often a useful thing that I find is that we use the person's iPad and we video or we film their movement and we have a look at what's happening and we sit back and watch it together. And we look for variability. And these are often ways in for physiotherapy. So for example, a tremor might stop when a person turns around a corner um, this is a useful thing for us to try and uh, address with our physiotherapy. So just to have a look at it and start to get a bit of a sense of what's going wrong. And of course, there might be situations when things are going right, and these are things to sort of explore as well. Something that we're doing more and more, and I think is often missed, is bad habits of, of resting postures, the way that people sit and stand that influence their movement disorders and these are things that people often don't realize they're doing and i think these what i've called uh, maladaptive unhelpful habitual postures i think they change our our brain's representation of our body which then influences how we move so it changes it in a unhelpful way and we want to re recalibrate that body's representation in our brain so some bad habits that i often see are people who rest a uh, a weak arm just sort of sits in their lap. It might sit in their pocket or they might sit on their hand and keep it out of sight and out of the way. And this is unhelpful because we think that causes what might be described as a learned not use. And so the arm never has an opportunity to start to, to work again. And so it sort of becomes reinforced that weakness. This is something we see a lot, particularly people who have hypermobile joints or who are very flexible. They often rest in what I'd call an end range posture. So you can see this person's feet are right at the end of uh, in inversion. They're leaning to one side, they're twisted. I think people might do this because they, they find these, posi these comfortable positions. Often if you can't feel where your body is or you're quite hyper hypermobile, these end range postures are, are grounding and they feel very comfortable, you know where you are. But the problem is this changes our representation of our body and our brain. And then if we move back into a normal position and a neutral alignment, it feels very uncomfortable and we start to want to go back into these end of range positions and they start to influence the way we move 
and they start to cause muscle tightness and the, the, the joints start to prefer this position and they get a bit stuck. So one thing that all of us can do quite simply at home on our own is start to recognize these unhelpful postures and change them. And they take a long time and tell people, don't expect to just stop doing it now. You might need to take a couple of months to sort of get used to a new position because this is a position of comfort and it's a bit it's a bit mean to take it away, but we need to we do it slowly. The last one to mention is people, especially people who have feet that turn in, they always or they almost always sit with their foot up in a position like this. And you can see with that person's foot up on the bed, the, just the position of the bed forces that foot into inversion it's turned in to the maximum and it's pointed down a bit so when they come out of that position they try and straighten their foot it doesn't want to go back into the position it's comfortable it's uncomfortable or painful so they move it back into that position but this is something i see a lot people often sit on their foot and i think it's really unhelpful and something everybody can do is start to try and phase out these maladaptive unhelpful habitual postures useful thing to do is sit in front of a mirror and just sort of get that mirror feedback do i look aligned do i look sort of symmetrical you don't need to look perfect you don't need to sit like a soldier but if you do lean to one side or you cross your legs on one side then you need to be sure that you can also do it the other side and feel comfortable and then after we looked at the postures we start to get into retraining movement and the way we do that is usually we go through this sort of uh trajectory starting with standing up and sitting down it's a really useful place to start it's something that can often change more quickly and easily than other things and it's something we can usually get better quite quickly and then we move on to standing with weight shift stepping walking getting on and off the floors stairs outdoor mobility and if we're doing well some people can, we can start to retrain running everyone's a bit different I'm going to go through and show you some videos of this, but in this setup, you might see that the person's tucked in between two physiotherapy plinths, give them a bit of safety, and they're doing their exercises in front of a mirror. And what I think a mirror does is it gives them feedback so they can see that they're moving more normally. Um, I think the mirror, paradoxically, I think it redirects their attention away from their body, for some people, that is. So rather than this person's attention being sort of stuck on their sensory motor state inside their body, I think what's happening is they sort of shift their attention to the surface of the mirror. And if you can, if you can get used to looking at yourself in the mirror, it can be really useful. But it's true, I see some people who, who find that watching themselves in the mirror makes it a bit harder but most people if they get used to it find the mirror useful to retrain their movement and it's something you can practice at home if you've got a full length mirror so here are some examples of people who've done well and i'll admit that it's not everybody who can get these really great sudden changes maybe we're looking at about i think 20 percent professor stone said of people who can have a resolution of symptoms this person has, as you can see, feet that turn in, it might be called a functional dystonia. Um, and this is the way he stands up from a chair. And you can see he's holding onto the chair and actually he's using his arms to stand up and more than his legs. So he's lost that using your legs. He's lost the momentum that you use to stand up and in using his arms and not using momentum to pull yourself forward, it allows these postures to stay there. So what we would do with this person is, is really work on his, his standing up and sitting down and, and that taking his arms away, getting him to use his feet. I'm gonna show you a video of that later, but for this man, I'm gonna show you how we do uh, sometimes walking practice. So a lot of our patients are sitting, standing in the gym and they just practice weight shift just like this and they practice it in front of a mirror. And they spend a lot of time getting this rhythmical movement. And you can see it's smooth, it's symmetrical, it's even on both sides. And he's spent a lot of time practicing it in front of a mirror and he's getting forwards and backwards movement there. His attention is on getting rhythmical movement. But what's happening down here is he's, he's moving his feet away from that intern dystonic position. If I ask him to try and straighten his feet, the opposite happens because it's an attentionful movement. This is a nice way to initiate walking. If I ask him to take a step, it would probably be a bit of a step with a dystonic interned foot. What I'm asking him to think about is to keep his weight shift side to side, which he's been practicing, and just shift his weight over the supporting foot to initiate movement, really without thinking about it. And that's something we do with a lot of our patients, and we find it helpful. So what this is, it's initiating stepping without thinking about it. All of his attention is on weight shift. 
he just happens to be moving forward. So he did very well, and this was him at the end of his treatment. So I was talking about standing up from a chair, and this is this is a different person, but you can see that standing up from a chair. Again, he's using his hands, his feet are turned in, but he's not really got any weight on his feet. If we put some scales under it, he might be taking 10 or 20% of his weight. And really, you can see him pushing down on the bed there, it's taking all of his weight. So by not using his legs, he doesn't get appropriate muscles turning on. If we can teach him how, it's because he can't do it, if we can teach him how to use his legs, these muscles will turn on a bit more automatically, and in turning on automatically, I'll probably straighten his feet. So we had a lot of practice. This was in the same session. Again, this is somebody who had a simple problem who did quite well. But all of this practice of standing up and sitting down gets the right muscles turning on automatically, and his feet position started to become a little bit straighter over time. He's doing it in front of a mirror, and he's, he's very safe between two plinths, so he's got something to hold on to. So important steps are that he's wriggling forward. So he's moving, he's, he's not just sliding his bottom forward, he's moving one side forward, then the other. That's quite a, a controlled movement, requires a bit of coordination. And by practicing that shuffling his bottom forward, it redirects really his attention away from his feet, which he doesn't know his attention there, but it's probably there holding onto the floor, keeping him safe. The redirecting his attention up here with that movement helps to relax his feet a little bit. The next thing we're asking him to do is to really bring his trunk and nose forward to get, and we ask him to a little bit faster to get some momentum. So that turns on the muscles at the front. And when muscles at the front turn off, the ones at the back automatically relax a little bit. And so we just have lots and lots of practice standing up in front of the mirror. The other thing to do when he sits down is to tell him not to sit all the way in the back of the chair, just try and sit at the front of the chair. And that sort of helps him to, to sort of grade his activation of his quads. So just practicing standing up and sitting down can take someone a long way, helps them get a good stand, which helps them then move on to walking. So we build up the components of, of a complex movement, like standing up from a chair in little bits. So it might be wiggling forward to the front of the seat, making sure your feet are positioned under your knees so that allows you to use momentum. A big part of standing up is momentum. It's not just our muscles. We sort of use a fast movement. Thinking about nose over toes as you stand forward and your shoulders come forward. And we break it down and we practice at that. And then once we've got it, we try and do it quickly so it's a bit more automatic and using the mirror's feedback. And what we did there with gait, with walking, we got somebody to shift their weight side to side, and practice that for quite a few days and it took him quite a few days to get it side to side and forwards and backwards, keeping the rest of his body quite stiff and firm and the movement coming from his ankles. And then from side to side weight shift, his feet came off a little bit and then he just started moving his body weight forward on top of the leg that's standing and he developed a bit of a creeping walk, which we could then process into or sort of progress into a, a, a stepping walk. Some other strategies to think about in physical therapy and physiotherapy is we just want to normalize movement by tapping into automatic movement. And often that's about moving a little bit faster, but of course, for some people, we need them to slow down. It's often harder to move more slowly. Uh, with a tremor, if somebody's shaking, we want to get them to impose another movement on top of it. So if their arm's shaking, sometimes we might practice them clapping or doing big flowing movements and then resting it down to stillness. And a lot of people, well, I've repeated this twice, hold their breath. Oh no, relaxation of proximal muscles with a tremor, sorry. So often their shoulders up and everything's turned on. And what we need to teach them, and often it's another useful thing to put in the mirror, is learn how to, to relax muscles. And often we get them to practice lifting up their arm and just seeing it drop down because all their muscles are turned off. And if they can relax their arm to that level, then often the tremor starts to subside. What normally happens initially, they lift up their arm, they let go and their arm stays there because everything's turned on and co-contracted. So learning how just to turn everything off in front of the mirror, shoulders low, arms and legs taking up the support of the chair and taking some deep breaths. A lot of people really hold on to their breath when they are, and that's part of the problem, their sort of breath holding. So learning, teaching people how to sort of relax their breathing and take breaths while they're moving 
um, and not hold their breath can make a really big difference. We do the stop and reset. So if people have symptoms, that's maybe as they start walking, their walking gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And what people often try and do is they try and push harder and, and try even harder to, to bring back the normal walking. But often what happens is the harder they try, the more they think about their body, the more their symptoms start to turn on. So in those situations, really simple strategy that's very effective is just to get people to stop, take a deep breath, reset, and then start again. And then they often start again from a better baseline. And in doing that, they might have to take lots of stop and resets along the way, but what they're doing overall, it might even slow them down, but they're getting better smooth movement. So they're not practicing and reinforcing the unhelpful movements quite so much. Talked about uh, using mirrors and with our patients, they need lots and lots of practice, lots and lots of repetitions in front of a mirror. It can't be done once. And so what we sort of suggest is that they practice throughout the day. So with learning how to do a perfect stand up and sit down, they practice it for an hour in physiotherapy, but it's something you do throughout the day, all day, all the time. So every time they stand up, every time they sit down throughout the day, it's an opportunity to do a physiotherapy exercise without having to put time aside for physiotherapy exercise. So it becomes reinforced that way. And write everything down. Our patients have a book. We get them to bring a book and we write everything down. We don't need to remember everything because we write it down. We address secondary problems, so pain management, fatigue management, exercise tolerance, and soft tissue tightness. These are quite typical things for physiotherapists to address, and they need a bit of thought. So pain management, fatigue management, often what's happening is the patient's pushing themselves too much and they're busting out their pain. And really what they're doing, if they're pushing themselves so they can't move anymore because their pain or fatigue has stopped them moving, they're really reinforcing. It's like they're practicing that pain cycle. And so their pain comes on more and more easily each time. So what we want to get people to do is learn how to take little breaks throughout the day so they're not pushing themselves to 10 out of 10 pain all the time. Um, and soft tissue, if people are developing soft tissue contractures, if they can no longer straighten their ankles anymore, for example, this is a really difficult thing to address. This is an example of it. Somebody who might have what's called fixed dystonia. Um, often it's also associated with something called complex regional pain syndrome. So that's a type of pain that's very, where skin gets very hypersensitive, very painful. If this person is given what's called a passive stretch, so if you just sit there and stretch the muscle when they sit there, it, it's going to increase their pain, which is already high to 10 out of 10 and above. And it's not really that useful way to do it. So often the best thing to do is to do it gently, to try and find ways for the, the joint, the ankle joint to move through range within normal function. So try and find ways to place it on the floor, the foot on the floor and stand up, get it used to taking some weight and moving through function, rather doing a very painful passive stretch. Because if a passive stretch, I mean passive in that somebody's pushing the foot rather than the person moving their muscles, what happens is often the muscles oppose and resist the stretch, and it increases the pain, and the higher pain makes them want to pull further into that dystonic position. So you need to be a bit more gentle. But something that works for some people is using electrical stimulation. So the electrical stimulation here helps to pull the foot into a better position. Not everyone can tolerate it, doesn't work for everybody, but it's worth asking a physiotherapist if you can try some electrical stimulation uh, if you're having muscle activation problems, muscle tightness problems. Self-management is a term that's used in rehabilitation a lot for all conditions. And really the way I, what I think it means is giving the patient all the information they need to get the most out of their rehabilitation and so they can help themselves as best they can. Um, so the way we do that is we use a workbook and we just, everything we sort of talk to the patient about their symptoms is we write it down. Um, there's, and when I do every session I do, I have to write notes about what I do for my physiotherapy for each patient so I can keep a record of what we do. And that helps me remember where I'm at and remember what I'm going to do next time and to take it forward. So if I have to do that, it makes sense to me that for people attending physiotherapy, if they wrote their own notes, they'd really learn a lot about their treatment and see the progression and start to get some ideas. So I ask, I write my notes and I ask my patients to write their notes as well. And I ask them to bring them in and we review their notes together because it gives us a, a reminder of what we did in the previous session. And then we can start that session reading the notes, thinking where are we gonna take that today's session? And so we take it together where we want it to go. 
We write down in our workbook strategies to help move and improve. We write down pain management, fatigue management strategies. If they're collecting outcome measures to monitor change, it's a really motivating thing if we're starting to see change. Or we might even see a bit of plateauing out of progress. We write down goals and aspirations. And also what's really important is plans for managing difficult days. What do I do if I can't get out of bed on a particular day because everything's bad? And that happens to everybody. Really, it's just important to say, well, it's, it's okay that that happens. It doesn't mean that everything that's happened before that is lost. It just means people have setbacks and it's okay to take a day off. We write down some things that they can do, like, can you take a day off? Can you sleep in for that day? But still, can you get out of bed? Can you get changed? Do some gentle things. Maybe we found some exercises or strategies that help symptoms that they can do. And it's just about allowing yourself and forgiving yourself for having those bad days and getting back on track when you can. The big thing that's talked about a lot is AIDS and adaptations. So, um, and it's sometimes a bit of a source of conflict. People might want to use a walking stick because they can't leave the house without one, or maybe they're falling. A lot of people can't access work or go to the shops without a wheelchair and they want a wheelchair. And often they hear from clinicians they shouldn't have a wheelchair because it will make them worse. So I think it just needs to be considered carefully. And I think the patient needs to be involved in the decision making and understand why the therapist might be concerned about them using it. The way I talk about it is let's have a look at what a wheelchair would do. Let's think about all the benefits it would give them. Let's think about all the negative aspects, how it could make things a little bit worse. And if the person decides the wheelchair is the right thing to do, let's put in a place to try and minimize the negative impact of that wheelchair. So can you find opportunities to stand and walk without it in a safe way, just to keep your physical fitness up? Um, one thing that generally isn't helpful is immobilization and plaster cast to try and stretch out ankles and hands. That, that sometimes makes things a little bit worse. So then a lot of, a bit of caution needs if people are doing what's called serial passing. There are plenty of useful adaptations and adjuncts that might be helpful. So just non-specific exercise as best you can is really useful, it's just helpful for making you feel a bit more normal again. Uh, exercise helps with your well-being and mental health, and it might even help your symptoms. I've talked about using mirrors and video to get feedback. We do a lot of treadmill training for people who are doing gait rehab, and sometimes we can use a harness to make sure people don't fall. You've seen me talk about electrical stimulation and TENS, so that's just using TENS as electrical stimulation, really as a distraction. It's useful for some people, and there are other more sort of less used things like EMG biofeedback and hypnosis, virtual reality are, are things that might be being developed at the moment that generally aren't all that accessible. And there's probably, there's definitely value in group interventions. So helping, allowing people with FND to speak amongst each other, to learn from each other, is a very valuable resource for a lot of people. It's hard to know exactly what the best amount of physiotherapy is and how intense it should be. So there's a little bit of evidence to say that for some people doing it quite intensively, a couple of sessions a week is helpful, but that's not so helpful for people who have very uh, for more, more severe pain and fatigue. If you do physiotherapy very intensely, you can often drive up the pain, drive up the fatigue, and that can make all the other symptoms worse. So more intense treatment is probably not useful for people who don't have pain and fatigue, which really limits it to a smaller percentage. Um, but you can see a physiotherapist or an OT in when you're admitted to hospital and outpatients virtually or in home treatments. And there's a little bit of evidence that each of them can be helpful. Um, frequency of sessions. For me, I like to do sessions quite bunched up at the beginning, a couple of sessions a week, and then slowly taper them out. And we do nine sessions of physiotherapy for people. We usually bunch them up at the beginning and then taper them out with the last session at one at three months. And some of that is to do with the limitations of the NHS. So we give nine sessions. Our first session sometimes lasts for 90 minutes, but then we try and keep them to under an hour. Um, and duration of treatments in the literature, it talks about five days to six weeks. How does physiotherapy help people? We don't really know, but maybe there's neuroplastic changes, so better connections in the brain and, then, and in muscles that improve coordination, strength, and endurance. It definitely helps people understand and get insight into the symptoms, lifestyle changes, motivation, psychological benefits. Maybe also it reduces the threat value of symptoms. Neurological symptoms are very scary, especially if you don't understand them and you don't have control over it. If 
Therapy helps you understand your symptoms and gives you a little bit of control. It makes them a little bit less scary. Maybe you attend to them a little bit less and it helps them improve. Patients who go through our intense treatments say that they find the intensity, although tiring, important, as long as they don't have severe pain and fatigue. They feel like a bit of a structured program gives them momentum. They like seeing changes on video and mirror, although it's a bit confronting at first. Overall, it's useful. They like writing their notes. They like their family attending. They find that useful. And usually when I ask people what's the most useful part of physiotherapy, they don't say the treadmill training. They usually say it's understanding what's going wrong and how I can, how I can change it. I'm going to just finish off now by talking about the research that we do and that has been done. So it's quite limited, but actually it's really increasing over the last 10 years. And the, the research for physical rehabilitation, which might involve just physiotherapy or multidisciplinary rehab with psychology, OT and physio, is quite promising. At the moment, there's only two small controlled trials, um, but there's quite a lot of cohort studies, so studies with more than 10 people. And as a group, what they find is about 60 to 70% of patients have a good outcome with rehabilitation. These are patients who are selected for rehab. So they're, they're generally thought to have a, to be suitable for rehab. So they don't have very, very, very severe pain in this outcome group. You can get moderate to large treatment side effects on uh, outcome measures. Uh, when we score their mental health before and after treatment, it doesn't seem to change. Uh, but there is some early evidence that it might be cost effective. So in the long run, it might save the NHS money to give early treatment. And on average, benefits are sustained for one to two years. Though so most people get a bit of a loss of treatment effect over time. And symptom resolution, maybe about 20% of people can get a complete resolution of symptoms. So we're testing out the efficacy in a very large multi-center randomized control trial called the Physio for FMD trial. We've recruited about 270 people into the trial and we've had a bit of a break due to COVID and we're gonna recruit maybe another 100 people. They're randomized to a very specialist treatment program or to typical neurophysiotherapy. And what we wanna find from this trial is, is specialist physiotherapy effective and does it save money? So the results from this trial won't be available for another year. It takes a lot of time and a lot of money to run a trial like this. But hopefully, we're hopeful that this will provide some evidence that the NHS needs to spend money on rehabilitation for FMD. So in summary, this is people with FMD have a really big, vast mixture of different problems. And so you need to think about each individual carefully and design treatment specifically for their needs. Multidisciplinary rehabilitation is gold standard. So if you can involve some psychological therapy or some psychological informed physiotherapy or occupational therapy in your treatment, it's probably better. Um, but different treatments are, are necessary because there's lots of different types of people. When physical therapy is done, it's best done through education, movement retraining, redirecting attention and teaching self-management strategies. So thank you very much. There's a lot of people that sort of influence this talk and are involved and I've acknowledged some of them there. I've talked for a long time, but I'm happy to take questions if there are any. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, thank you, Glenn. Uh, so yeah, we have we have uh, five or six minutes left. So um, we'll just have a look at um, uh, a few of the the questions. We had questions earlier on, I suppose, about the training needs of physiotherapists, and uh, I think in in acute general neurology wards, um, we find that physiotherapists um, are familiar with lots of people with FND, but in terms of dose and how long they can spend with the patient. Um, that can be a significant challenge. So they're, they're able to spend a sort of short 10, 15 minutes with the patient. Um, and the carryover of that isn't, isn't always very significant. And, and you talked um, about the varying kind of dose and how much physiotherapy people need and how it's delivered. Um, and uh, I suppose we were just wondering, in terms of um, how we be skill up physiotherapists generally in FND and how what kind of settings services should be delivered in. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that general sure. area? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first thing I should say is that uh, therapies in the NHS are quite underfunded. So 
most therapies in England and around London where I work have long waiting lists because they have more people being referred than they can treat. So often at the moment, uh, treatments, uh, physiotherapists might not spend as much time with somebody as they'd like because of management. So what we need are the evidence from the trials like the one we're doing to say it's effective, but you need to give nine sessions. And so a one-off, here's an exercise sheet, good luck. I don't think it's useful. So you need to give a, a proper exercise. And so I think for me, I think about nine sessions is the right amount to set somebody up to really give them a good go at retraining their movement, to give them things to go away and practice and to go away and do that for six months to a year, and then maybe they can come back. Um, and, and But there are also other groups that have more significant problems and they might need, say, inpatient rehabilitation. So we need a range of options, but I, my, I think um, short sort of one or two sessions aren't that useful. I think we need to be giving about six to nine sessions. Thank you. So we had a, a question um, from Lee, and I know you can't obviously answer a specific question about an individual. I suppose what they were what they were debating about was kind of being at that stage where they feel reliant on the rule later outside due to balance and their FE symptoms, and then when they're in the safety of being inside, they they feel a lot more secure not to use it. Um, and the things that you've talked about today in terms of fear of falls and kind of reaching that, that point where um, there's a sort of dilemma about how far can I push myself and how do I kind of progress past that barrier, this was in terms of people's self-management and at home. Um, and Lee was just wondering about how you match those transition points or um, how people make the decisions in terms of, of risk and positive risk taking and moving from environments where they might feel quite comfortable and familiar into uh, the kind of the, the community and, and places where people feel at higher risk. And could you maybe just tell us a bit generally about how you come up with a plan with people um, to manage that from maybe moving from home or gym into the, the world? It's a, it's a really hard thing to do. It's one of the hardest things to say, now is the right time, put it away. And I don't think it would be that simple it needs to be individualized doesn't it and so um something that i do which a lot of my patients find useful is to say let's let's define maybe three phases or four phases phase one is you need your rollator indoors and outdoors if you don't use it you're going to fall over and we don't want that we don't want it. we want to minimize that risk and so you're going to use it indoors and outdoors we're going to do some rehab and we hope to see some improvement and then you might move into phase three where you use it most of the time, but there might be times in the house where it's safe and there's lots of walls and furniture to support you and you can start to walk around your house with um, holding onto the furniture and you might need it in the hallway and you'll need it when you go out. So you start to use it a bit less. And then they might start to feel ready for phase three where they don't need it indoors, but they might use it outdoors. And then phase four might be they, they keep it with them. It might be in the car, for example, at Rollator if they need it and they're having a bad day and they can they can access it, but they might not necessarily use it. So they, And they can move backwards and forwards between the phases as if they have a symptom relapse. So I find that's quite useful. And then when the right time is to sort of move on, I think it just needs to happen a bit naturally and the patient needs to build confidence. And usually what happens is I might help them build confidence and other people might help them build confidence. We need to talk to their families to allow people to make take sort of positive risk taking. And it needs to be sort of an understood risk. So families sometimes are a bit worried and say, don't, don't not use your frame and that might sort of prevent people from getting better. But sometimes it's helpful to talk to families. And then um, often what happens is they get to a point where it's just more convenient to move without it because their confidence increases, they're not realize it and they find themselves just sort of moving to the kitchen and they haven't taken their frame and that's probably the time they it's sort of a bit more of an organic change i think that's the best way to do it i don't think it's all that useful to say stop now and don't use it ever again because they need to build up the confidence to back that up thank you thank you i know and it's kind of a tough question because it, it, it i know it varies but yeah um, thank you for that okay we're nearly out of time we just had uh, one further question if that's okay um 
Joyce had been asking about a thing that we do recognize, which is she's talking about when, when she would stand in a queue. Uh, usually when standing in a queue, there is the issue of having to be in one place to wait, have people behind you, to have eyes on you, that kind of thing. And it's a situation that she talks about finding it provokes symptoms or is difficult to, to tolerate and describes it sort of shifts and paces and finds us agitated in those situations. Um, now, we know that one of the reasons is just the environment of that and, and having weight and the tension that builds up in people. Um, queuing generally isn't a very nice experience. But um, I was just wondering if you had any experience of people finding that they focused attention increases in those types of situations and anything you advise people to do. Um, in kind of situations they find themselves the high risk or find that their uh, attention is focused a lot on their bodies. It's something we talk about a lot, queuing or sort of waiting to pay for something and it comes up a lot and a lot of people say it's really difficult. So um, firstly, we do, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of, people laugh at me for the, all the weight shift and swaying I do with people. Um, but what it does is when you're standing, you often become very aware of you standing and you become very stiff and often it becomes quite sore and people get back pain. And what people actually do, if you watch people standing in queues, most people shuffle, they shift their weight from side to side. If you don't do that, you've seen soldiers standing to attention, they sort of faint because they're not shifting blood up anyway. So it's useful just to shift your weight from side to side um, and have a few strategies in your back pocket to sort of think, oh, I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable. I'm gonna sit my feet apart. I'm just gonna shift from side to side. I'm gonna step, step away and I'm just gonna lean on this surface for a bit and then come back. So shifting it up and just sort of not getting stuck into this sort of thing where you start to think about it and you start to notice other people looking at you. So just having things to do to run through is really useful. And then if you can, we go out and practice it. And this is where I like working with my occupational therapy colleagues because they're doing often doing things in the community with people and we sort of come up with some strategies together and the occupational therapists and psychologists might say well let's design a an experiment where you go out and you're going to go and pay for this and you're going to practice those strategies and you're going to come back and we're going to talk about how it went what went well what didn't and we won't workshop it comes up a lot i think it's good to have a bit of support to practice it and just to build up the confidence but sway and weight shift is my short answer <laughs> Okay. So, Glenn, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for a really informative talk and, and being with us today. Um, <clears throat> you're in high demand. I think if we could move you over here and you could come and work with us, uh, there's lots of people be happy in the, in the comments. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we'll uh, continue to have connections. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for joining us. So, uh, cheers. Uh, absolute pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to break um, for lunch now, um, and we'll be back at um, around about uh, one o'clock. Um, thank you, everyone.